All right. Um, welcome. I'm Sabrina Roach with the Alliance for Community Media Northwest Region. I'm also on the foundation board. Uh, to this session is Visioning the Future, Digital Inclusion. Um, so uh, we have folks from Business Oregon, uh, the city of Portland, and Multnomah County Public Library. Uh, everyone's going to introduce themselves, talk a bit about what they're doing, and uh, issues that they'd really like to talk about today. Sound good? All right, wonderful. Uh, Chris, would you like to go? Sure, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Tamron, and I'm with the Oregon Business Development Department, uh, where I work with federal, state, and local governments, uh, communities, and service providers to promote the deployment of broadband telecommunications infrastructure and uh, the adoption and utilization of that infrastructure for economic and community development. Uh, I provide staff support to the governor-appointed Broadband Advisory Council. Uh, this is a statewide forum for the discussion of broadband issues and public policy. Uh, it seeks to encourage coordination and collaboration between economic sectors and organizations. Uh, it seeks to leverage the development and utilization of broadband for education, uh, workforce development, and telehealth. And it promotes broadband utilization by citizens and communities uh, so that economic and community benefits can be realized. Uh, infrastructure doesn't produce value unless it's put to use. Uh, council members uh, represent Oregon cities, counties, tribes, uh, telecommunication service providers, educators, economic development organizations, public safety agencies, healthcare providers, uh, the Office of the State CIO, uh, the State House, the State Senate, and the uh, Public Utility Commission. Uh, ahead of many states, uh, Oregon has a formalized broadband public policy uh, in statute and resolution. Uh, it's the goal of the state to promote access to broadband services for all Oregonians to improve the economy, improve the quality of life, and reduce the economic gap between Oregon communities that have access to broadband digital applications and services and those that do not. Uh, it is the policy of the state to promote, facilitate, and encourage activities and uh, projects and businesses that improve Oregon's IP network infrastructure, its performance and connectivity, uh, and uh, connectivity to the internet backbone network for the benefit of Oregon's users. Both in broadband availability uh, and in utilization, compared to other states, uh, Oregon ranks highly, uh, especially for being a big western state with a relatively small population. I think that one of the greatest broadband public policy issues and challenges facing Oregon and the nation is the continuing digital divide. Uh, Oregon has made significant progress in the deployment of broadband infrastructure throughout the state over the past 15 years but it's not enough. Uh, the digital divide continues to exist, and what constitutes broadband uh, is a moving target. Fifteen years ago, the digital divide uh, was considered to be those geographic areas that had DSL services available and those that were on dial-up. Uh, today, the divide is between those areas that have access equal to or greater than the latest FCC broadband standard, uh, which is currently 25 megabits per second down and 3 megabits per second up and those areas that are not. Uh, nationally, 55% of people living in rural areas have access to the service transmission speeds uh, identified by the FCC, while 94% of people living in urban areas have access. And I'll add that only 37% of Americans living on tribal lands have access. And the divide is not just related to population density, uh, but also factors of income, ethnicity, and education and age. Less than 50% of households with income in the bottom 20% use the internet at home, compared to over 95% of households with the incomes in the, hot, in the top uh, 20%. So the digital divide continues to exist and may well be contributing to the economic divide that also exists between urban and rural areas of our state. I appreciate the focus uh, that this group and others bring to the issue of digital inclusion. And uh, I look forward to our discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Rebecca. 
Hi, I'm Rebecca Gibbons. I am with the City of Portland Office for Community Technology, and I am the Digital Equity Program Coordinator. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a, a chronology and history of, of uh, where we've come through to get to a Digital Equity Action Plan. Um, starting in 2010, the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission's Your Voice, Our Communications Technology Study, which is a, was a community needs ascertainment related to cable franchise renewal, was broadly conducted in our area to provide the first data set for Multnomah County identifying specific digital equity inequities, um, disparities. Then in 2011, OCT conducted a community engagement process to develop a broadband strategic plan. The City Council adopted the broadband strategic plan in September of that year. And Portland's broadband plan uh, eliminates, uh, the goals of the plan are to eliminate accessibility and affordability gaps for all residents. In 2013 and into 2014, we worked to get a digital equity elements incorporated into the city's broadband, uh, excuse me, the Portland plan and it, the comprehensive plan. These are the two uh, long range strategic plans that the city is working with. The Portland plan specifically is organized around an equity framework um, with strategies and a set of measurable objectives to track progress, and it includes three action areas related to broadband deployment and equity. OCT also commissioned a broadband adoption report that re uh, revealed that 18% of our households with income under $30,000 don't have internet access at home. And that rate increases to 28% for people who are 65 years and older and 30% for Hispanic households. So these weren't just the statistics. These were real people with real identified uh, disparities that they were facing. So this was the data that staff really needed to embark on an internal uh, discussion and started to engage with our external partners. The library, Multnomah County IT, uh, Portland State University, and a few others um, began to meet informally uh, to plan around digital equity work in our community. And that was the beginning of our digital inclusion network, uh, which we call the DIN. Um, the DIN is an informal coalition of organizations uh, interested in digital inclusion that continues to serve in an advisory capacity now that we have a digital equity action plan in place. Um, the group in, uh, includes community nonprofits and business partners, um, and we worked together to uh, host a summit back in 2014 that helped us raise awareness with our elected officials and began to identify strategies and partnerships for a community-wide digital equity plan. Um, in 2015, we conducted, we hired a consultant and we conducted some focus groups and uh, community engagement workshops that resulted in us drafting a digital equity action plan. Uh, the Portland City Council and the Multnomah County Library Board and the Multnomah County Library, um, um, excuse me, the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners all adopted that plan in 2016. Um, so that's that. We have been implementing the plan since then. Um, our first year was focused on um, some implementation goals around uh, building capacity, identifying lead partners, uh, identifying uh, critical areas to measure our success. Uh, the plan is focused on bridging the inequities for underserved populations. Um, we are specifically targeting uh, people of color people with disabilities, uh, people with limited English language uh, uh, proficiencies, um, and older adults and low-income families. Um, so that's the work that we're, we've been embarking on now. We're into our second year. We are leading up to our next summit, and I, I think I'll hand it off to Matt because we are really partners in this work. Um, our story and our timeline uh, leading up to the digital equity plan are a little bit divergent, but since the digital equity plan, it's something that we've uh, really come together and worked together to engage our community towards a collective approach to addressing the digital equity issue. Right. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Timberlake. I work for Multnomah County Library. Um, I manage a portfolio of IT projects for them, and I work on issues around digital equity and inclusion, along with many other people at, at uh, the library. Um, so that's a lot of great information, a great chronology of where Oregon's at. Um, I want to 
just pick up on the deep a little bit there. Um, our digital equity action plan, uh, Portland sort of leading the way here, became, has become something of a national model because we took a very collaborative approach. We didn't just look at statistics and look at technology and think about what would a plan be that could address this. We had focus groups, as I think you mentioned, and we brought lots of stakeholders uh, to work on our digital equity action plan. Um, and that includes the big telcos, community-based organizations, um, local and uh, local government organizations um, to talk about how we could improve digital equity in the greater Portland area. And um, th one of the great things about that collaborative approach is that it gave all of these diverse organizations a stake in the success of the plan, having helped us write it and craft it and bringing their ideas to the table. So that was, uh, I, I think that's why we, it, it's proved to be such a, a popular model. And Rebecca and I just spoke about it at uh, the Digital Inclusion, the Net Inclusion Summit in, in Cleveland last week. Um, so Multnomah County Library, we were uh, at the table when the Digital Inclusion Network was first uh, put forward, the, this idea, there were just a few of us. Um, and I, I wanna talk a little bit about what libraries do, you probably all know that libraries have computers and people can go in and use those computers and that's, uh, that's terrific. I think the scale of what libraries do around digital equity and inclusion is often not, um, not always grasped. Your local Multnomah County Library will do two and a half million sessions this year of public access computing and free Wi-Fi sessions. So in a, in a community of our size, that, that's a good marker of just how great the need is. And, and that's true for libraries all across the country. They have become the largest provider of free access in their communities, in their cities, large and small. Um, so the libraries also, um, we're one of the principal groups that offer training, but we offer hundreds of classes on computers, including very basic classes to get people started. I think. One of the things that, that digital inclusion folks have identified for some time and talked about is that there are these sort of three legs to getting to digital equity. It's access to broadband, but it's also um, a device to use it on and training and support for that device. And um, at the library, we partner with organizations like FreeGeek to help people get devices, and we offer lots and lots of training classes, including, again, very basic ones, in, in lots of languages. Um, so um, let's see, what else do we do? We, uh, I, I think the, um, uh, there's lots of other folks that we partner with, like Hacienda CDC and the Latino Network and others to offer outreach program. So the library is not just in our 19 branches, in our 19 branches in Portland could all fit in the Seattle main branch where so we have such small spaces as some of you probably know. Uh, but out of those 19 branches we do lots of outreach as well. Um, so I think that's a good intro to the library. Fantastic, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great moment to talk about um, how you involved community media centers in creating the plan, um, the, the, those stakeholders, um, and uh, how that worked out. Um, because of course, we, when we think about libraries, we know about the access to broadband devices and training and support. And when we think about public access centers, we think about these same elements. Um, and I know that uh, from last year's panel on digital equity, uh, folks from Metro East and from Open Signal talked about, and Free Geek talked about the plan, their involvement in it a little bit. But can you uh, share some of that for this audience, the folks with us today? Sure, um, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, our community medias, we've been very fortunate, our community medias uh, centers, both Metro East and Open Signal, have been phenomenal digital equity partners from the very beginning. They've mm -hmm. been at the table, part of our uh, focus groups discussions and our workshops uh, in the development of the plan, identifying community needs, 
the work that they do on the ground, engaging with other nonprofits or working with underserved communities is invaluable information that they brought to the table in the development of the plan itself. Uh, since plan imp implementation, they, um, we do through our digital inclusion network, our DIN meetings, we um, come together monthly and that has been one of the wonderful benefits of us coming together as a community to work on this issue is that we present a, um, an opportunity uh, once a month for us all to come together and strategize and share ideas and both Metro East and Community uh, Open Signal are uh, regular attendees and involved. Um, they have also uh, established wonderful partnerships as a result of the Digital Equity Action Plan in those discussions. Um, as example, uh, the libraries earn mm -hmm. a computer program, um, both the library and N10. Uh, well, N10 and Google had a fellowship program, and the library and Free Geek um, both had a fellow um, working with them for about a year. And uh, th that fellowship program developed an Erna computer program. They partnered with Metro East and Hacienda CDC and Home Forward, which is our assisted living, our HUD assisted living um, housing authority. And they put on these five week training programs with underserved communities, multiple different languages. Um, the, the residents would go through this training program. Uh, they would build confidence. They would learn privacy skills. Um, and at the end of the end of the day, they would go home with a computer and they would learn about access and uh, Comcast Internet Essentials program, low, low cost access. So it was a great opportunity. Um, so I think our community media centers are uh, wonderfully positioned with their connections to the community to really help us work on this issue. Yeah, they also, um, we have a, a makerspace at our Rockwood branch and um, I know community media has been very involved in helping us put on classes about filmmaking and mixing and uh, uh, they've been great partners uh, in terms of outreach like that and that's a very popular way to get young people into a library if they can make their own mixtape or they can make their own film. Um, it fires up those creative juices and lets them see that they can do this and community media has been a great partner in, in those programs as well. I'd like to also make a comment about libraries. I remember uh, predictions that libraries might go away as we move into the information <laughs> age, and the exact opposite yes. mm -hmm. uh, has happened. They've become key locations, key points of access, uh, particularly last resort access yes. for, uh, f uh, for people that don't have access to uh, uh, the internet in their homes or maybe the devices mm -hmm. yeah. to use it. So when we look at digital inclusion challenges, I, I see libraries as, as being one of the key uh, solutions mm -hmm. uh, and tools that can be brought uh, to bear on that uh, because you, you provide a point of, uh, of free access. And uh, just to, uh, as an aside with in education, for example, as uh, schools, public schools, all schools, move towards digital content, distance learning, mm -hmm. and uh, cloud-based applications, um, and students need access to the internet to do their homework. Yes. If they don't have uh, internet access at home, uh, that's a significant uh, problem, uh, and it's called the homework gap. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and it's not uncommon to see uh, public library parking lots full of cars at, at night uh, yes. for access to the Wi-Fi, as well as at other sources of free Wi-Fi like McDonald's. Uh, to address that. And when we look at the barriers of, um, of broadband adoption, you know, it's, a, it's access to connectivity uh, is, is one key barrier. Uh, cost, you know, being able to have the means to obtain it, and then also have the device and the skills yep. uh, to, uh, to use it. And then uh, maybe the last one is perceived value, is it, do they see it as, as valuable? But the library ch checks all those boxes. You provide resources uh, to address those barriers and help people on, which is which is very important to do yeah. if they are able to, um, uh, you know, participate. Uh, yeah, we in our society in our economy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's 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 a um, a big role that libraries fill, and um, uh, I think having those public access computers as well. We we check out Chromebooks also, and um, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a student trying to do their homework on their phone because it's the only device they have, but they do somehow, but it's very difficult. It's not the same as having 
having a, an, a computer that you can walk up to and, and log in. There are some libraries, I believe, with the Dalles is one public library where they also check out hotspots. Yes. So you can uh, go to the library and check yes. out a, uh, a mobile access device that you can take home with you yeah. uh, to have access to the uh, internet. Uh, there was, well, there, uh, I don't know what the Dallas does. There was a program that f was funded by Google and I believe one of the telco carriers, but uh, where you could check them out for up to six weeks. Yeah, and Very they have multiple, <laughs> like 30 or 35 hotspots uh, yeah. in stock, and they, and they yeah. rotate them. Seattle Public Library also does that. Yeah. Um, do we know of uh, public access centers that, that uh, check out Wi Fi hotspots? Or. Chromebooks in this or laptops in the same way. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Laptops. Laptops. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have confirmation on laptops. Um, when pulling folks together for the focus groups, mm -hmm. um, this is just a nuts and bolts question. So, so folks can go home and replicate this. Did you who who convened the focus groups originally before the? Digital, the DIN mm -hmm. uh, got momentum and you know started doing monthly meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did those original meetings come together? We hired a consultant and it was funded through the city of Portland and Multnomah County. Okay. Um, and the consultant did, uh, they worked I think um, to, with the community, with some of our um, organizations that had already come together to kind of work around this issue, mm -hmm. to identify uh, some of our underserved community, uh, communities, and then identified. We had five focus groups um, with uh, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese speakers, um, uh, people of color, and people with disabilities. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have any insight uh, when it comes to organizational structure at community media centers? Were were director level folks invited to come? Were folks at a different point delegated those responsibilities? Do you happen to know how those that institutional engagement happened? Um, I don't know entirely. I mean, the, our the executive directors have been involved, but it also has been their um, a digital equity or their communications or their community engagement people. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Are there any questions in the room at this point? Okay. Any reasons why you came to this session and not another session? <laughs> no reasons. Oh, yes. yes. Go on. <laughs> uh, person I'm not, I'm not from Salem. Related to a, a group. I'm just here as an individual, and I, I personally am uh, curious about what uh, planning is being done in regard to the possibility of, say, Comcast. Uh, you know, the, with net neutrality changing the, the, some of the rules of the game about uh, broadband and, um, and the fact that as far as I know, um, uh, you know, Comcast or whatever digital or digital company, um, cable company funds these community access channels, that could change given that neutrality. So I'm wondering if there's any planning being done around that possibility. Well, I, I can uh, offer that net neutrality is a very hot uh, political issue uh, at the moment. It was a policy implemented by the FCC uh, under the uh, the last uh, administration, and it uh, it's a policy that requires uh, internet service providers to treat all data traveling over their networks equally. So no preferential treatment uh, depending on who the content provider is or who the customer. Uh, uh, customers are. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, a network uh, that's open and everyone has equal access to it and nobody gets preferential or faster um, uh, transmission of, uh, of their data or establishment of their connections. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, the FCC uh, repealed its net neutrality policy and is currently working to uh, implement it, in fact, it may be actually being implemented uh, with the, this month. Uh, but it's very controversial. Uh, a number of states have uh, filed suit against the FCC challenging uh, the repeal of that. Uh, Oregon is one of the uh, uh, signatories to, or one of the participants in one of those uh, suits uh, against the FCC. 
uh, states uh, are uh, passing net neutrality bills of their own uh, with different of different flavors. The state of Washington uh, passed a uh, a bill uh, reestablishing net neutrality uh, policy within its state. Oregon passed a net neutrality bill. It doesn't require ISPs to provide net neutrality, but it requires public bodies uh, like local governments and the state government uh, to only uh, to do business with internet service providers that adhere to net neutrality um, uh, policies, uh, and there are some other qualifications uh, on that. Uh, some states have uh, had some uh, uh, executive orders uh, around it. And then there in the uh, Congress, uh, there are numerous uh, advocates of net neutrality that are, have bills uh, to be introduced and introduced to reestablish, require the FCC to reestablish the, uh, the net neutrality policy. I, I think it's an issue that's going to be churning uh, mm -hmm. for, for a while yet, certainly through the rest of this year. Now, I don't think that as, as a single thing is going to affect what a company does in terms of its contributions to local community um, services or not. I don't, I don't see a direct connect there. It is, it, it does impact digital inclusion um, in the sense that, uh, you know, well, first of all, net neutrality is what we've had in the internet really up until pretty recently. So the order by the previous administration's FCC was codifying that and, you know, establishing their jurisdiction, the FCC's jurisdiction over that, which the current FCC has, has, has stepped away from. Um, but especially for community media, uh, you know, when you have, uh, when you uh, are prioritizing traffic, it doesn't matter whether you let slower traffic, you don't have to throttle it completely, you just have to make it slower and people will not t tune into it. And I think especially for community media organizations, who do not are not able to pay to to be have prioritized traffic and for uh, obviously a whole range of voices if if only the uh, the voices with deep pockets uh, perform well if your ISP can select what uh, what websites you get your news from obviously that's uh, that's really problematic so uh, yeah it's a big issue for net inclusion and for community media. I'm wondering if you're trying to get at something like some catastrophic scenarios. Is that something that you're talking about? Like, what if Comcast just decides to pull out of a city and then you're not going to have a fee for use of public right of ways? So then, yeah, well, <laughs> is that kind of where you're going? Yes. Uh, well, because I know like, places like Montana, there was a struggle to get the, the, some of the um, companies to acknowledge the, the right to a public access city. And so, um, so I just think that depending on, on traffic and saying that the traffic that they're supplying, the, the access they're supplying is no longer going uh, to a cable channel television station, it's now going to completely to, to digital access, to, to web access, that they're no longer a cable company. I mean, there could be that kind of change that, that just legally well, says I mean, what change you are, you, you allude to, uh, is that we have changing patterns of use. Right. Uh, more and more uh, subscribers are, are doing what's called cord cutting, uh -huh. uh, and then they're, they're, they're discontinuing their programmed entertainment services that we're used to with uh, uh, cable companies or, or satellite companies, and instead uh, taking streaming video uh, over their broadband access from pr uh, content providers like Netflix uh, or, mm -hmm. or Yuhu. So, and, and that. Yeah. And that is a significant trend that's taking place. From a cable company to an ISP. And, but, and on the other hand, cable companies are uh, market dominant internet service providers. Uh, mm -hmm. And in Oregon, they're, uh, they have an over 50% market share as an internet in the providing internet uh, broadband services compared to uh, <laughs> like telephone companies, for example, which are down around 30 percent. This question certainly solicited some activity in the room. So I've got a stack of uh, Mike and then jo John. Yes. Okay. So, so Mike. Um, I mean, so that very scenario, though, I think points to a structural issue that we need to address, <clears throat> both in our field, our fields, common fields, as well as in the as well as generally in the industry. The 
the public benefits that we see derived within community media spaces, production capacity, uh, staff assistance for facilitation of, of, of community voices or, or local origination, local content to counteract <coughs> you know, dominant, dominant media distribution that doesn't actually meet your community's needs, right? Because you don't have a choice about what's being pumped at you at a, at a rapid rate, at a rate. Plus, I think most importantly, the distribution mechanism to get to people's homes is being specifically countered by this question of broadband capacity mm -hmm. within municipalities and counties and jurisdictions. In case after case, the discussion is going like this. Yes, we would love to be able to provide more capacity for your organization to be seen on a cable channel, but no, we cannot provide it in high definition. Mm -hmm. because we have to be using the capacity <laughs> to be able to meet broadband needs. And since it's a fixed pie, meaning it's a zero-sum game for total capacity on their networks, primarily because it's some cost investment and not really looking at expanding, expanding the investment, um, the legitimate needs of, of uh, the digital economy are being used to ratchet down the legitimate needs of the local economy. And this is something I think it needs to be very, very sensitive to because in community after community, basically, when people buy HD television sets, they stop watching SD channels mm -hmm. because they look like, okay. I won't use an, in, uh, an indecent word, it's just more streaming. They look bad. But they look bad. <laughs> they look bad. Even though local production is being done almost in an entirely in HD, and the cable company is stepping stepping and down converting into SD purposely to ensure that there's less viewers watching the channels, to ensure that there's less community support, to ensure that in the next round of negotiations, there's less investment in community institutions. So, rather than having a, a, a dismal cycle, we actually need to build a virtual cycle where we're building our organizations, we're doing mutual reinforcement. And I think that's a central challenge I put, put to you. Because in community after community, it's enough for local regulators to say, oh, well, we want broadband. Because they're so desperate for capacity mm -hmm. for the local economy. Right? And the entire idea of being able to see your community, um, see your community's uh, culture hear diverse voices within a media space is being obliterated because what's being presented is dominant culture coming specifically from New York, Los Angeles, London, maybe maybe Miami. It'll come from Mars at some point. I don't know. It's not coming from, from the locale. So I, I just sort of, it's not a question. It's like a structural challenge that needs to be addressed. And we can't have an either or. We have to have both and, right? And, and, and I think even specifically in terms of like the content that makes people want to be a part of the digital economy has to be local. It, 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 it has to be going beyond the, the Oregon context. In community after community, in, if, if I don't see, see people like me within the media space, and I can't make that connection with institutions that are meaningful for me on my terms, I'm not a part of that economy. So that, I, I think that the danger we have is that we're, the danger we could be facing is that, is that digital inclusion, is, digital inclusion, the broadband economy, community media are sort of like different islands, right? And one is being played off against the other. And we need to have a both and situation. And, and that's sort of, sort, of, this sort of something I'd like you guys to think about or even, I don't know if it, this resonates in terms of your work. I'd just be kind of curious about it. Um, I, I think that that example that you gave of where things are at right now is a great case for why net neutrality is so important because a lot of that comes off the table with net neutrality if the traffic is be, being treated equally. And if, if telcos, your notion of them playing off each other, playing off different needs off of each other, um, is, highlights the, the model of scarcity that current 
telco providers <coughs> use in the States, where we pay a great deal for pretty middling internet service. And um, other countries are leaving us behind in terms of it, it costs less, and it's they're all moving towards much higher speeds. So um, net neutrality and a model that, that fosters investment in the infrastructure, um, and there are a lot of models out there. We were just at net inclusion, and um, mm -hmm. the Stockholm model was discussed a fair bit, in which you, know, you get ISPs to, co to compete over public uh, broadband. Um, there's a lot of solutions out there, and a lot of them work. And uh, I think your point about the threat to community media and just all, all sorts of um, voices that are not about that dominant media. I think cable, the cable companies, the big telcos, they loved selling us 90 channels. And there were those 90 channels, and that's what we watched. And the internet took all that away. People have just been dropping like flies, turning away from that content and finding their own online. And um, it's uh, well, I, you know, not every. Not we, we, it's, we should have a discussion. Sure, but my my point is that net neutrality for for community media and for all voices, local voices, is just very important. For that very reason. I just want to know what can we do here and now. We know what the. We are in an ocean. We have sailboats. Our own communities, our own state, Washington State, our own county. We can adjust our sails of that boat we are in. You know, the, the, the tides of the oceans in D.C., thousands of miles away. You know, we can exert collectively whatever we can. But perhaps my thing is, I mean, you know, vision in the future. She was asking, Sabrina was asking, why are you here? So there's a reason. You know, we want to envision the future and have the watchful eye as being, you know, stewards of our local community media and how can we have that watchful eye and what can we do to create that, you know, and, and to nurture that uh, community media and those uh, inequities and disparities and, and access for all folks mm -hmm. in our communities. So what okay. do you think, um, you know, uh, you yeah. also, what do you think we can do, I mean, you speaking to my heart, what can we do in our cities, in our counties, in our state, mm -hmm. that, that we can change. Absolutely, I mean, I think the local voice is very important. Um, I think sharing the, the local specific community needs, knowing really well what your issues are and what the local needs are is really important and being able to communicate that back out. Um, having a strong um, relationship with uh, your city um, or your regulatory body or the body that's overseeing your cable franchises is really important, especially from an advocacy level. Um, I know uh, locally we are, <coughs> through the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, are strong uh, advocates for community media, for local needs, for digital equity, um, for ensuring that we do have the public, strong public benefits included in our franchises and that we're envisioning how that change is going to happen as the technologies converge, as things change, you know, what is the vision for the future and ensuring that we're speaking that um, out on the national stage. So to follow up on that, though, I think what people are wondering about, at least this is what I'm hearing, is what are other funding models that, that you all are, you know, hearing about at NDA and other places um, to be able to um, continue, I mean, the cable, the cable franchise model has been a model, um, but as we all know, the, you know, cable franchise fees related to cable television services are, are diminishing. Um, and so what, what are you all seeing out there for funding models for digital equity and community media work um, at, you know, at, at the conferences or other places or what's being contemplated at the state? I don't, you know, is there, are there things that you're seeing that, that are ideas about what we can focus on? Mm -hmm. um, I think from, uh, from our net inclusion discussions, there's been a, a lot more of an integration of digital equity work and the work that's happening around um, engaging communities um, has, has seen much more of an overlap with smart cities initiatives now. Mm -hmm. um, and so diff looking at different funding models through, through those projects um, has been a highlight. 
Um, um, so smart cities, the, they're the, the technology projects that are coming to cities and wanting to engage with cities to access city assets, streets and sidewalks, lampposts to uh, deploy uh, new Internet of Things technologies. And I think the, the idea is between that is negotiating those kinds of agreements. There are other revenue streams that could help the city um, as they embark in those types of projects, especially if you're taking um, an equity approach to um, engaging with those organizations who are using the public assets. Are you talking about panels on utility poles and say the city of Boston gets $95 per panel on utility pole and then that money goes into their digital equity work? Correct. Something like that. Yeah, something like that, or sensor projects or things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think um, folks in our virtual reality, augmented reality panel earlier would say something about um, community self-determination and community profit from those sensors. So that's another way to link that in. That communities should own their own data and self-determine what, who they sell that to and um, how that how that all forwards as an economic mm -hmm. development tool sure. in that in that community. Yeah. There, there are so many moving parts <laughs> and uh, so many dif different issues are, you know, around content and programming, around uh, physical infrastructure and then you know, rules and policy on how that infrastructure uh, is used uh, and how access is provided or denied. Uh, so again there's, there's lots of different uh, elements so you're you know, gonna to pick, pick your issue and, uh, and attack it. I think to your comments, uh, yes, engagement mm -hmm. is the answer at all the levels you identified, uh, beginning uh, with local and, uh, uh, and, and state and then, and then federal. So you know, particularly on these large uh, national issues like, like net neutrality, uh, engagement with your, you know, your, your, uh, your, your congressional uh, representatives and, and getting associations that you may be a part of involved in that issue and uh, you know, making your position known uh, to your elected officials uh, is important as well as directly to the FCC. And talk, John, what's the topic of your, your comment? So I kind of want to take the channels out of it okay. and talk about what would happen because there are examples of when municipalities take over the internet and provide it to their city or to their smaller town. How does that play in? Because that strikes me as, as the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. Thank you, Mr. Johnny Rotten, for that one. How do we solve, you know, we talk about equality, inequity, etc. That divide still exists. That's my question is, is there any other alternative to what we're doing here right now if we went and took it out of the big players' hands and put it into the city's hands? Well, there are, there are alternative models. So we have you know, examples of municipalities uh, building and, and operating networks or building infrastructure and then having other uh, providers uh, uh, you know, op operate them. So uh, an example in, in Oregon would be the city of Sandy. Mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. built a fiber to the home uh, network and is currently providing symmetrical gigabit service uh, available in all households, all premises and within the city limits uh, at $59 uh, a month. And you, I think you can get uh, 300 megabits per second for $39.95. Uh, and they just provide provide the access, and then you can uh, and they provide uh, they're acting as internet service provider, and there are other internet service providers available uh, on the network. There's a separate um, provider of uh, of television services uh, uh, that that that, ri that rides it as well. Uh, there's there are other models like uh, Ammon Idaho has also a, um, a fiber to the home network uh, that it built, and it's it's simply. Uh, built and owns the infrastructure and then uh, uh, opens that network infrastructure to a, a large group of prov providers and customers can change which providers they use uh, online uh, on the fly. 
And so if they're not happy with one internet service provider, uh, they can change that provider to another, but using the same uh, municipally owned uh, fiber network. Those are all relatively small um, portions of the overall uh, market in the, in the United States. Uh, we have basically a, a private sector model. So we have large telephone companies, uh, large cable companies, uh, increasingly large mobile wireless uh, companies that are, that are providing uh, network access. And that's in contrast with other countries that have more, more of a public-private or publicly owned uh, uh, infrastructure or postal telephone and telegraph PT&T uh, kind, of, kind of model. So hypothetically speaking, in 10 years, if cable companies, the dinosaurs, have gone away, and uh, what is the future for the community media and uh, everybody has access, uh, fiber optic to the home, you know, provided commercially or by the municipality or state or whatever. So what, would, what kind of transition would the community uh, media organizations will need, TV stations, to, you know, transition to that? kind of future, hypothetically speaking. Are you asking who's going to pay for the tools and the training of community members so that they can create their own news information and, and culture sharing? No, and I'm looking for capital <laughs> investment for the community media. I mean, you know, we will need to have our own huge bank of servers and video and demand servers and other things. Is mm -hmm. What would we need to, for that transition, for the ultimate transmission, ultimate transmission? Transition, so to say. Do any of you have something to say to that? Your ideas? Because I, mean, I have ideas. I'm no expert on it, and yeah. we might have I feel an expert. Like yeah. A but way that we prepare for that is putting together projects like what you've done, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the answers will come from the community. Um, and you are creating the relationship infrastructure mm -hmm. to continue mm -hmm. those conversations yeah. moving forward and making a plan moving forward. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's just one of the best ways that we can prepare ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Having one of the things we've been working on very hard with the deep is to just raise the awareness of digital equity as a profound issue for all communities and, and the impacts that it has and the millions who are left behind and having a, a I think raising that awareness also raises the case for funding community media. And by reinforcing those relationships and creating spaces for that plan, that community planning mm -hmm. and those conversations, they're creating the opportunity for transformation of who is making those decisions mm -hmm. and who's doing that work even because mm -hmm. they've created this process of engagement. Rebecca, did you have something? Well, I was just going to say, I, I, it's very similar. It's creating that space in those uh, uh, conversation spaces. Um, so as the technology changes um, and as the community needs change, we'll be hopefully uh, coming together as a community to you know, learn about those as the transition happens. So I think creating that space, that community space, to continue to engage as that technology evolves is very important. There was a lot of activity in the room as these ideas got more sparky. Um, folks who wanted to, to talk next, can you raise your hand really quick? I see Mike there, <laughs> and then I see Kathy. Okay, Kathy, I haven't heard you in the room yet during this hour. Mike, is it okay if Kathy goes? Yeah, cool. Can I defer to Mike, actually? Because I, I actually Do it. answer some questions that I'm not going to answer, and I think he might be more in this thread. Cool. So I'll defer. Uh, I, I, I I just have to say that, that the discussion is great, but there's a bat, there, are, there are multiple battles going on right now in the federal and state policy arenas where local communities have to be standing up for their rights, mm -hmm. and we're failing. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I mean, historically and currently, uh, City of Portland and the Commission mm -hmm. have been champions, not just for your rights in your community, but for the rights of other localities across the country. And it has to be it has to be recognized, mm -hmm. you know, publicly as often as we can. But you are a lonely voice, along with probably <laughs> three other I would say three other localities mm -hmm. that fund the majority of public interest law 
and challenges at the FCC and in Congress, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, mm -hmm. probably the city of New York, the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And it's no coincidence, frankly, that, you know, it's like, it's literally four, four communities across the country that are standing up for tens of thousands lo of localities that will not stand up for the rights of their citizens. And it's outrageous. Second, so I would say the first thing that needs to be happening is that you need to go back to your communities and say, pony up some dollars to fight for your rights, damn it, mm -hmm. and quit free riding on people who've got a spine. Because that's what county attorney's offices and city attorney's offices are doing around the country when it comes to telecom policy. Mm -hmm. They're riding on the backs of four communities, mm -hmm. and it's not sustainable, and we're losing. Mm -hmm. A. B. At the state level, you're getting steamrolled by telecom interests that are either A, getting rid of the ability for communities to actually self-provision municipal, municipal mm -hmm. broadband mm -hmm. systems, right? Yes. Or B, B, you're losing the fight over the ability to compensate for public property. So wh while we're talking about the wonders of the smart city movement, mm -hmm. huzzah, we get to, to lose all of our privacy to sensors mm -hmm. that are going to be around measuring, measuring, measuring us all the time. Huzzah, wonderful. <laughs> <coughs> but we're giving it away for free. Mm -hmm. Or in other instances, states are limiting the capacity for communities to get any appropriate rent or compensation for the use of public property. Mm -hmm. It is a gold rush, a land rush that's going on right now at both the federal and state, state level where the wireless industry is driving this and the cable industry is more than happy to, to step in and drop compensation for uses of public property. The prediction that I have, and I think this is like a hair on fire mo moment for everybody in the room, goes something like this. The federal government, in concert with state governments that wish to ratchet down the rights of individuals and property owners and the public and give away, give away rights to make money in perpetuity for the people that they're captured by, mm -hmm. right? Uh, are specifically going to find ways to be able to ratchet down compensation for rights of way. And not just for the use of wireless, but once, once, once you can't recover more than the cost of installing a wireless antenna, they will come after the franchise fee and the cable fee. And they'll say, we need our just desserts because basically you've given, you've given away the store to, to AT&T and the Verizon. So that will happen in 18 months unless you stand up and fight for your rights. Okay? And everything we're saying that's nice about, oh, well, we could, you know, we could get money off of a deal, that's all very well and good. But what's happening in state after state, and it's like 14 states that have basically eliminated the, po the possibility of doing anything but cost recovery for use of public, right, public rights of way. Mm -hmm. Okay? You need... You need to fight for your rights within the state to ensure that you have the ability to be able to control your rights of way and get appropriate compensation for it. And I would say that's probably going to be a fight that's going to happen in every state of the union, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got to fight for the ability to be able to actually have communities across the country actually make investments, right? Because that's not the interest of the federal government at this point. Third thing, now let Kathy actually some, say something that is wise and not sort of filled with invective. Because she's a, a wonderful person who's, who's generous and, and creative, and I'm just pissed off about this. <laughs> <laughs> the third thing is, we're, we're now 15 years after the Brand X decision. Mm -hmm. And we still do not have the political will to say, broadband is getting a free ride for the use of public property. Okay? And we need to build a political movement that says, yes, Yes, broadband for all, but you need to pay for the use of public property. Sorry. Quit with the free ride and the libertarian nonsense and the Ayn Rand bullshit. <laughs> you need to actually pay for the use of public property. And we need to build the political will to say that. And, and to stand up for our communities. Stand up for people who can't stand up themselves. Mm -hmm. And we are not doing that. Okay? And I... I, I, I I'm going to stop with the speed at this point. <laughs> but, like, that's the it's fight that I'm having in DC at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the reason why I'm trying to get people to say, listen, you need to stand up for, like, a principle 
And like, you know, everyone's kind of like, oh, well, oh, we're going to get small cells. Oh, it'll be great. Oh, it'll be great. Oh, we'll get sensors. And I'm like, God damn it. For Stand folks, up for yourself. For folks who don't know so, Mike Wasser, uh, so, so, <laughs> he, uh, he is the president. Friends here, but, uh -huh. so, but, but that's how it also connects with community media. Yeah. And it connects with this question that you're talking about in terms yeah. of where we need to be in 10 years. If we do not build that political movement, there is no possibility to be able to use public property to be able to have mm -hmm. public benefit for the rights of all. I'll just yes. say that, so, uh, I just want to say, having just come from Net Inclusion, mm -hmm. Rebecca and I, in Cleveland, there are lots of people fighting this fight throughout the country. So I, your point is well taken about cities leading the way. I, one of the points that was made at that conference is that regulatory capture happens very much more readily at the state level uh, than at the local city level very often. But um, I just want to make that point because that room was filled with people who were very passionate, passionate. Mm -hmm. fighting this fight, mm -hmm. not rolling over. They're in D.C. in the trenches trying to change this I, there. I, I, mm -hmm. so, I, I work with them. I work with them all the time. I just know who's paying the bills mm -hmm. along, with, along with your commission. Yes, I, I know mm -hmm. who's paying the bills. Mm -hmm. We need more people stepping up and paying money for that. That would be right. great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think we'd all be in favor of that. Yeah. But this is what I'm getting at, is that, is that well, it, it, can't be, it can't be four visionary communities. Mm -hmm. We actually have to be building mm -hmm. a movement. And we can, we can build on uh, the grassroots ruckus that's getting raised over net neutrality right now. Free Press, a media reform organization, when they put out a call for volunteers to work on net neutrality, I believe they got 1.5 million people stepping forward to work on that. And in my book, net neutrality softens up the ground when we want to have discussions about ISPs paying fees for their use of our public property. So, of course, near and dear to our hearts and public access and education and government TV, we see the cable subscribers going down. We need to go... I believe is one of the things that we need to do is go after that. Um, the well, work in partnership with the ISPs on a mm -hmm. fee for their use of of our public property, of course. But a um, little bit of context for folks who don't know Mike. He's uh, the president and CEO of the Alliance for Community Media, um, the national organization of which Alliance for Community Media Northwest Region is a member. Um, <sighs> There's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we are smart and resourceful and we can raise a ruckus. And we can get things done. Mm -hmm. uh, we're one minute over the time for our session. Okay. Uh, any, any pressing parting words? I know Kathy didn't get to speak, but she's good. I see that now, okay. Um, anyone here? Well, I think I'll maybe restate, which probably everybody already understands, and that is that this is essential infrastructure. Uh, it's essential uh, for us as a state. It's essential for all our communities throughout the state, so we have to have uh, the infrastructure and the capability and the access and the skills uh, and the support uh, in all areas of the state, not just the uh, I-5 corridor and the metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. and that's going to require uh, some work. And I think we're going to need some public policy vision to think one step, you know, one move ahead of where this is heading because uh, the technology and the applications have outstripped our existing regulatory and, and, uh, and taxing structure. We, mm -hmm. we, we have a regulatory structure that's built around the public switch telephone network, uh, which is going away. And it's being replaced by, and, and, and in many sense, uh, one possible scenario of the future, and it's hard to know, because whatever the future is, we're at the bottom of a, of a hockey stick curve. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, phenomenal uh, to experience and watch. But uh, one p potential scenario is that we're going to be all moving to a, a common IP network for all applications. And, uh, and how access uh, and cost is distributed among all those users um, are important issues that I don't think are, are defined from a public policy standpoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, you know, yeah. we need leadership from, from these vari the various interest groups uh, that can help uh, paint that vision of, of where we should be heading mm -hmm. and help uh, the rest of us interpret what's happening from a technology standpoint that's going to change our lives because it's going to impact us all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah.
I, I would, I would uh, yes, absolutely support that. Um, I would also just add that, um, you know, having uh, your policy uh, platform being informed by what your local community needs are, really understanding what your local community needs are so that you can develop and put forth local solutions is really key. Yeah, uh, I, those are both great points. And I think Chris's point about the, the regulatory framework now is years behind, decades behind, and never mind the technology that's coming that's going to mm -hmm. take so many of these things off the table. And it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and then just to say that um, I think supporting what's happening right now, so we talked about libraries providing public access computing sessions. Well, a, a library system, Douglas County, closed right here in Oregon. It was voted, it, it, the, own, the residents who count in, in that economically hurting area voted to not fund their library, even though it was providing services to help lift people out of poverty. So uh, there's a bigger narrative problem here that I think community media plays a vital role in. And I, I, think, um, I think as we talk about these bigger issues and how to take on the big telcos, I think also thinking you know those smaller narratives about what's happening with people being left behind. You gave some great statistics, but I don't think you, the numbers now are, it's about 90 million Americans don't have access to broadband. And you know that's just, those kids can't do their homework, that we are really worsening um, that as bad as our disparities, economic disparities are now, we are worsening them. And it's really impacting the communities that have been impacted, uh, communities of color, rural, tribal, the, the elderly, uh, low income. Um, it's, uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think thinking about those local stories is important too. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.